Hello, and thanks for choosing this podcast from the Information Security Forum. Hello to everyone tuning in, no matter if you are a regular or this is the first one you've listened to. If you are here as a newbie, then feel free to explore the archive as we've covered a really wide range of InfoSec topics. I'm sure there's something in there for everyone. Uh, a lot of people enjoy this podcast while walking their dog, so I hope the weather has been good to you and your doggy while you are both getting your exercise. It's been a strange old summer in the UK, um, so I hope it's been a bit kinder uh, no matter where you are. Um, I just wonder if there were a podcast for dogs, what would be on it? Uh, pup music rather than pop music, I guess, and perhaps the sounds of cans of dog food being opened. I'm sure that would win it quite a wide audience among our doggy brethren. Anywho, this episode is continuing our exploration of the role of the Business Information Security Officer, the BISO, um, and seeks to expose just what a BISO does all day. Uh, to answer that question, we have some real-life BISOs with us. Uh, first up is Adriano Pinero, who is a BISO at Air Transport Technology Service Firm, CETA. Hello, Adriano. Hi, Mark. Uh, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. So are you one of the first BISOs at CETA? Are there other ones up there, there as well? Yeah, there are other ones. I would say that is I'm the last one of the first wave. So uh, in CETA, the BISO role, it has pretty much a year and a half, almost two. So it's a very recent uh, introduction of that role in, in the company. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the second BISO we have is Sneha Ahuja, who is a BISO at heavy equipment and product manufacturing management firm Alpha Laval. Hello, Sneha. Hey, Mark. The weather this side is already very nice. So Good, good. Excellent. I'm if you go for a warm later, you'll be able to enjoy it. Uh, so I was wondering, are there more BISOs at Alpha Laval? Are you the only one mm. or...? No, we are we are a good team of uh, six, uh, six. To, to, to be hired soon. And right. uh, this role has been established around uh, close to two years, two plus years now. Right. Okay. March. That's kind of interesting. Cool. Yeah, we'll explore that in a bit. Uh, also, here is Paul Watts, who needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, Paul is a former CISO who has researched and written about uh, the BISO. Uh, so, hello, Paul. Hello. I love a good BISO me, but I couldn't eat a whole one. Uh, you've uh, you've observed BISOs in the wild for quite a while, haven't you? I think I just wondered if there are any particular evolutionary pressures that brought them into being. Are they the cold, are they the warm-blooded mammals that are taking over from dinosaurs and things like that? I don't know. What, what well, brought them about? Why are they suddenly all over the place? Well, I'm not going to go all Attenborough on you, but, well, um, you know, I've hired a few BISOs in my time. And, and right. you know, for me, selfishly, as a CISO, the, the reason why I employed BISOs is I was expected to have eyes and ears right across the length and breadth of my business, and that is physically impossible. So BISOs were a, a very important um, part of my security function because they gave me visibility of what was going on at business level right across the organization. And naturally, it takes the tradecraft of security and puts business right in the center of it using security to solve business challenges, which is the way it should be. Yeah, so does that, Adriano, Sneo, does that sound like the kind of thing you, you guys are doing? Yeah, I, I would say so, uh, with uh, some uh, caveats, uh, depending on the size of the organization. But the need is there, uh, especially when uh, the complexity of uh, the technology footprint that we end up having in, in the modern world more and more, um, we need that those eyes on the field to collect what is exactly needed, and then that, that does. And then actually, what it means is that uh, the security is going to be really embedded uh, in the business, right? And not a standalone function that no one knows about it, and everybody hates it. So, Sneha, so is that the same for you? Just sort of, yeah. You're yeah, I'll, to... I'll add another perspective to it, you know, and and some more organs, maybe I'll call it. Uh, th these are the arms or the hands of the CISO that navigate into the organization and help them implement what they want to. You know, ra rather just just on the ground, you know, sit down with the business and help them implement what what you want them to do and how they want them to do, and in the same time, tell them why they want uh, you to do these these controls why, why are they important How, what do they mean about your business so. i think that's a great analogy as well because one of the things that bisos can do that cso's can't do is the application of context so i can say implement a thing implement a control but you can then take that to the business and talk about why that control is important in context and that's how you get the win because they need to understand what it means to them and with the best will in the world i can't articulate that at that at that 
operational level, and that's where Bisto's a perfectly placed arms, arms and legs. I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's a good way to think of it. But it, is there have for both you, you, you two, has the Bisto role emerged from a larger strategic program of change or something like that? I don't know if your organisations are trying to do something else, and that's why you've been, or is it just a, a realization that the that security needs to be closer to the business? It's 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 not an organizational change across uh, for a while, but uh, really more on the digital front. And okay. then when the digital front decided to um, categorize itself into different streams, and then and in parallel, security was get, getting more and more important, but the understanding wasn't getting as clear as the importance was growing. So okay. it, it just meant that they needed more people who can who in, be in congruence to the fact that, okay, business needs this, but they don't know how to do it. They don't know when to do it and what to do. So how do we help? Yeah, interesting. At CETA was a bit of the opposite, was uh, actually an organization change driven by an increased risk exposure uh, of our solutions, uh, not only on customer um, premises, but also hosted environments, cloud, and then uh, enterprise infrastructure. And it was really uh, to, uh, to attack uh, and then have the right controls to mitigate the risks that we were, uh, let's say, ingesting that we shouldn't. And it, that goes across not only for the, um, let's call it the enterprise footprint, the way we develop and deliver services, but also uh, supporting the sales team to ensure that we are not uh, getting into into trouble, right? By saying certain things that we are not possibly compliant to and also being uh, attentive to new regulations and certification demands. So it was really more from a risk exposure that uh, we wanted to, um, to to take care of. Yeah, I guess slightly different, but um, do, do you think you, even though you both have the same title, are you doing the same kinds of things? I don't know, Paul, if you found that, is that are there lots of different types of BSO? Well, I, I th- do you know what? It's an interesting one, that, because I, I think BSOs are going to go through the sort of identity crisis that chief information security officers have gone through. Yep. There is a huge amount of ambiguity and expectation that needs to be managed. And, and, and you know, I, I mean, I asked this question of, of both of you, you know, did, did you find in the early part of your tenure that there was a lot of negotiation where you were actually having to set the rules of the role of, in terms of what you should or should not be doing? What we have noticed as well in you know in our analysis of BSOs across the world, huge differentiations in salaries, in seniority, and and in remit. So I, I don't know, but I throw that question out to both of you. Have you found that you've had the opportunity to shape your role as you've gone along, or has it been relatively static for you? I think I'll start with saying that I've been in this role only 14 months now. And, and my organization has seen this role for around 24, 25 months now. So the role itself has evolved in both. I have as an individual evolved in that role, but the role in, in the company has also evolved. At the same time, it's I, I said we are six of us, right? And none of us work exactly the same way, even within the same organization. So it's uh, yeah, it's it's not a mold that you can put people in and then replicate. Uh, there's a reason why we have different streams, and there's a reason why there is one be so dedicated to each stream because the requirements of each stream and how they operate are different, and then hence how the be so operates is different. The risks maybe that they look at is different. Uh, the stakeholders are different. Uh, their, their end users are different. Or customers are different. That that could be one reason why. However, even as individuals, and and the role is evolving in the industry. Yeah. What what I would say in a compliment is that I don't really expect that the Bizo role long term is going to be as defined as the CISO. And the oh, reason right. is because uh, the the Bizo it is very and to, very close to the to different business right so we have to adjust to the business needs otherwise what is our value being that close to the business so i it's it's a fair assessment that we are going or we will go through an identity crisis but really i i don't think we should have the aim to set a very defined and and and, and role but on that organization and 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 let's say business area basis yes we have to define what is in scope and out of scope and that, in my experience in CETA, we were able to actually shape the role as we saw that what was needed. But again, 
it's a, a two-way street, right? We see it from a central, central perspective. When we get close to the business and see what the business needs, we need to go back and then do some adjustments, right? And, and one more thing I'd like to add that, that maybe we didn't cover that much in the first um, part. I think the BISO has also a very important thing is to challenge the CISO. Um, and, and that's tricky in ends being our uh, boss. Uh, and, but at the same time, we have a business to represent where security has to be in the right context, right? Yeah, that's interesting because I did wonder about whether you're the sort of um, advanced guard for the CISO, but I guess you're not. You're, you're, you are that sort of, you go, the, the, the information flows both ways from, from CISO downwards and from the business upwards as well. I think it has to be, right? Because um, I, I consider the BISO as, as it's a stakeholder management function where we have internal customers. And then if we don't gain their trust, we don't understand their business uh, and just come with controls, with policies, standards, they're going to just say, okay, I, I don't need you guys. I, let me do my own stuff, <laughs> right? So. Yeah. Yeah, they got some quite familiar criticism of InfoSec. But I wonder if... You know, are you doing the things InfoSec should have always done in terms of getting close to the business, but it, they just didn't have the people there to do that? I would say that uh, it's being done on a more consistent way. So that's what okay. makes a difference. So so then you have continuity and then you show the value that is that is behind those actions, right? But, but one thing also about the Bezo role, they have been there for a number of years, many years, I'd say. I've been doing similar part of that job five, six years ago, uh, but it was not that formalized under a certain name. So I think that okay. type of podcast and then the ISF papers out there, <laughs> they're very important to solidify at the role as an identity, as what as Paul was saying, uh, to really shape it up as an influencer within the inflammation security uh, aspect or, or community. If you uh, can you make that. a really interesting point there. We did observe a number of organizations that were actually on a bit of a journey and the BSO was a natural progression of that journey. So they were moving in the space where they were trying to work on awareness and education and cultural change and they were creating an entity known as security champions, which are almost like an omnidirectional messenger to take those those CISO led center led messages and 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 disperse them and, and add context so that they made sense at a business business level. But I think as very similar to what happened in the world of IT, where IT started as a very transactional order taking department. And then over time we realized as technology became more and more important to business trade and industry, that there needed to be a partnership. And I think security's kind of come of age and we realize that that's exactly the same for security now. So the evolution of security champions to BSOs in certain organizations is actually a logical progression for that. What I would also say as a CISO is if the business, when asked, you know, who is the you know, responsible for security, if they say Adriano instead of Paul Watts, actually, I don't have a particular problem with that. What's important to me is the business recognizes that there is some sort of focal point for security that has their back and has their interest and is trying to translate all of this mundane bureaucratic security and risk management into something that's valuable to the business. And actually, I would I would rather that they were talking to Adriano first than talking to me because my responsibilities as a security leader have now changed. I have to engage with the board, with investors, with shareholders, with, with, with suppliers, with people like that. The business need need the attention and they need the time. And that's where the BSO role, I really think, is coming into its own now. I, I think I can reflect on what Paul said, you know, that uh, IT started as, as what, just hardware, software installed and all of that. And then and then grew. There was there was ITIL. I, I did service management myself. And I think what I did you know, was that 18 years back or so as a service manager, I can I can feel I can see that match that how Obiso is now the bridge between security okay. and business. And, and it, it, it kind of echoes the same way that IT wanted to bridge that gap, that security now wants to bridge that gap with uh, with business. Yeah. So does every organization need BSOs, do we think, or every large organization that takes information security seriously? Is is there a, do they, are they needed everywhere? I would say rather the, the industries which are not so regulated, those that don't understand security and compliance. I mean, th those have not been historically regulated. Now to say industries are not regulated, yeah, I, I should just bite my tongue. <laughs> but, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. with, with these two and all of that, yeah. it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
name an industry which is not but those yep. that are newly being introduced to regulations but but still don't have a lot of pii still don't do you know not not retail not these but these these heavy industries uh, they probably need pesos because their understanding already of it is very minimum and then to add a security layer to it is it's just too complicated it's just too time consuming they, yeah. they feel it Yeah. yeah, I'd agree. I mean, when I was doing the research for the BSO paper, I was trying to I tried to establish what the potential critical mass, what that tipping point would be. And and it was really hard to put a kind of number on it. I, I think what it came down to, to your point, I think is a combination of size and scale and, and maybe maturity that then determines where that operating model needs to change. One of the things I said in the paper is that I think Yeah, certainly since the pandemic, you, you know, I know we don't like talking about it, but let's just kind of take ourselves back there a little bit. I think businesses realize the importance of agility and autonomy at, at an operational level is the key for businesses being able to stay in front of their competition. And and I've seen those changes in business operational models where, you know, a lot of autonomy and empowerment has been passed into those echelons of the, the business. But yet in security, we still kind of operate with a, with a center-led approach. And it, hmm. and it may be that I think what we're starting to see with BSOs is is that dispersal. So rather than having that center-led security function, we're starting to see a bit of a dispersal into the businesses. So so depending on the size and scale of maturity of your organization is probably the determinant factor as to whether you need BSOs or not. If you're a very small organization, pr probably not. But that doesn't mean that the CISO doesn't need some sort of business partnering arrangement in place. Or whether we hang and an, you know a label over that and call it a BSO, I don't know. But but there are a lot of exactly. considerations there. Yeah, yeah I, th I think as a function, it's needed. There is no question about it. Now, if you're yeah. going to hire a full time employee to be a BSO, that's a, a dimensioning exercise that needs to go in the in the company, right? Yeah. And and in certain cases, you you want to pair up the BSO with another security function, which could be uh, some sort of uh, specialists in certain area that the, the business needs. Yeah. So I think that's the okay. flexibility that I was talking about. Uh, it, it's not one uh, one recipe that's going to fit for all, right? So it has to be adjusted to the to the context you are in. Yeah, well, we're, we're glad that uh, Adriano put, you know, put that thought and it mm. reminded me to say that we are not all six full-time BSOs. Okay. Uh, in, in addition to the BSO role, which is 50% uh, of our role, the other yeah. role is leading a security capability. So uh, no half way. of my time is leading cyber, cyber supply chain, cyber risk management. So I lead that function across the organization and then I'm BSO for one of the stream in the organization. Right. And I must tell you that helps me keep my sanity in place. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. <laughs> but but it's a very valid point, isn't it, that you're making? Um, and then I'm if I, if I don't, my job it is supposed to be full time visa, but uh, we end up doing other things because it helps us to also be in touch with security, right? Uh, and the practices and order the challenges across the company. So it's a very valid point. Thank you. I think we should ask that question about what you do day to day. Is there a lot of meetings, I guess, a lot of reports, and uh, it's a combination. Of, it's like so many things. It's hard to describe okay. that one day after the order is going to be the same. Uh, oh. But of course, uh, there are recurrent things such as uh, looking at uh, different customer requirements and then trying to see what is that uh, our company would uh, how we would fit those requirements and fulfill them. There are other aspects that are security and tailored, I would say tailored security awareness sessions that is really dedicated to the business, looking at, at controls and then uh, supporting on answering questionnaires from, from our customers. So so it's a diversity of things. It depends on, on the week. It depends on, also on the strategy of the company. Sometimes right. uh, to the end of the quarter, there's going to be a severe push on sales. Uh, then we, I end up being a bit more dedicated to to, to sales, and and that goes on in the different um, ways. Just, just, just something to add to that. You know, historically, one of the challenges that we've had as an industry in terms of acquiring, retaining, and nurturing talent is that a technical background was seen as a barrier to entry. One of the things that has been observed with with incumbent C, uh, sorry, excuse me, BSOs coming into the role is they're not all having to come from a technical background. As long as the central function, dare I call it that, has the ability to you know, translate some of those business requirements into technical need and is able to impart on those, then actually the BSO can focus predominantly on that business, that business partnership 
and and actually the technical requirement isn't hard and fast as a mandate. That said, of course, there's opportunities to develop in role. And I think that's absolutely fantastic. You know, the idea that you can start in that business partnering BSO style role and learn about security at a technical level as you go by you know co-sharing or, 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 or dividing your time up into different duties. I think that's absolutely fantastic. And we really do need to work quite hard to to make the security industry accessible to people without a technical background because that that isn't a constraint anymore. I mean, there's the CISOs now coming into the industry that don't have a technical background and they're absolutely smashing it. Um, so you, you know, long may that long may that continue, and um, and and definitely in the BSO space, we are seeing more of that happening, which I think is fantastic. I, I would have initially thought I'll put down bullets of what I do on a typical day, but that was getting impossible. And then, uh, you know, I, I will just say I'm going to add to what Adriano says. And um, as I said, I I'm, I also lead the supply chain cyber risk. And this this is purely security again. I come from a technical background and all of us, at least in, in this part of the organization, come from a technical background and then are hosted in in business, but um, I, I do a lot of vendor assessments, uh, so to say, review security contracts and you know what goes into it. But but more recently, I have been participating in um, in setting up business goals. You know, talking talking in that perspective that and and then setting up these annual business goals means also means putting budget to things right now for what you need to do. And and I think that's that's a very good way or that, that's a good hold that the BSO can have or, you know, give them a word on maybe maybe you put some time, maybe you some put some resources here, maybe you put some budget here because you are saying you want to address critical security risks, then mm. you need to put uh, time and money into it. And yeah. then that that gets added into the business goals in, in some other form or way, but it gets added. Yeah, to your point on the technical background, uh, Paul, I think it's it's very interesting. Um, if I look at my career uh, in security, I actually um, was uh, had, had was lucky to have an opportunity. It was a kind of a bizzo that introduced me to security. Then I kind of immersed myself in security and then acquired a lot of uh, technical expertise. Um, but but I, I don't come, let's say, from the IT background or from any security background. Uh, but, but one thing it's for sure, um, it, at least from my experience, you need, after a while, you need to have some technical background, at least lingo, that's going to get you to a point where you can have uh, productive discussions either with a customer or internally to even challenge it either way, right? So I don't think the BIS role is going to be completely steered away from technical. I don't I don't believe that. But it doesn't mean that someone that is not technical cannot do it. It can. It's just that it has the willingness to learn. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. There is there's a grounding of knowledge you need to understand because you, you know what tech is like. You know you've you've got to be able to at least match pitch with them to a certain degree. Otherwise, you can't have a conversation at all. So that's kind of the na- nature of the beast. But I think you, your point is well made. But the opportunity to develop you know, deeper technical skills that you believe will benefit you on your career journey. I think that's that's great. I always say to, um, you know, students who I lecture to or, you know, new CISOs that I mentor, you know, you have to always remember that your value to any employer is a product of knowledge and experience. And I don't want to get people caught in a catch-22 where they can't acquire the experience because no one will give them a chance at the role. So being able to transition in and learn as you go you are acquiring skills and, and experience within the organisation doing that role. I mean, that's a win-win for absolutely um, everybody. I did have a question I wanted to ask both of you, actually. Um, depending on the cost model within an organisation, so let's say for the sake of argument that each individual subsidiary of the business owns the OPEX and the CAPEX for their investments in technology and ultimately in security. Uh, and the CISO in the centre may well be able to influence, but can't necessarily dictate that money has to be spent or not spent. In contrast to some organisations where the cost centre is centralised and the money comes out of a central pot. Um, I don't know what the, what the costing models are for your organisations and you, you, you don't need to explain them. But would you agree with me that actually some part of the BSO role is actually a bit of sales and marketing in terms of marketing the value proposition of what it is we're trying to do. do, you, do you, how do you feel about that? Do you think that that's part of the role? It just kind of happens with you? I, yeah, I, I just agree hands down, but uh, I don't know how successful we become because the moment you are a, a, a non-sales, non-marketing individual trying to market and trying to put numbers 
around it, you first need to show financial benefit. And we can show only benefit in the, in, in the way of no loss. You know, that it's, it's not tangible profit, but it's yeah. something that you will not lose uh, because you put uh, the right controls in place. So that's that's very tricky for us to get into that. But yes, we do have to, you know, put that hat on sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I'm 100 with what you're saying. For it's that if you look, if you look from the the control perspective, as you know, was talking about and control implementation, it's much harder to to show the value uh, because it's based on not losing. Uh, but then if you look from the other perspective, which it is uh, representing the company's uh, security posture, having uh, good discussions with customers and being out there in the market, that's uh, an amazing value that uh, the business can bring to to the table. Now we don't get the same sales incentives because we are not a sales team. So yeah. it's still, it it uh, for me, it's a good part of the job that I can represent well my company and then make a difference when when the discussions are are, are related to security. Yeah, I mean, to, you know, to going in the other direction as a security leader, and and it's it, it wasn't something as I was you know pro- progressing up through the the ranks I ever thought I'd have to do, but. You know, there are boardrooms out there that still haven't bought the meal ticket and still don't get it. And a lot of it, especially if you're the first CISO in an organization, the amount of the amount of, of, of sales and marketing that you have to do, not in the traditional sense, you know, like rocking up trying to sell them a sports car or something like that, but, but you have to sell the vision. You know, they have to buy in because if they're not buying in, and this is important for BSOs as well, because if that tone at the top isn't set, that security is important and it's, everybody's responsibility and is you know it has a correlation to the organization's revenue streams and customer confidences and so on and so forth you're you're kind of doomed to fail so they they have to buy in so as much as the CISO is kind of selling up into the boardroom and across maybe to the investors and shareholders you know the BISO is being able to keep the business running alongside saying yes this is important yes we don't mind doing this we absolutely value the conversations we're having with Stara and Adriano and they they're really really important yeah, overnight, we all, we've all got a little bit of sales and marketing need in, in our role, um, after all. Um, and it's important because I think security has realized now, I mean, say you said earlier about if you know if you're regulated, these are things that you just kind of have to do, you're compelled to do. But but we know as practitioners that, that the carrot is better than the stick. And actually, we kind of want to be, want to be loved and we want to show that we want to help and we want to support our businesses. Um, but sometimes that means that we have to kind of extel the benefits of what it is that we're um, we're doing. I think BSOs are a, are a great conduit for doing that and getting everybody's buying then top to bottom in the organisation. Yeah, I would say I would say so. Um, and we just need to be careful one aspect. And I like to see all, always both sides of of the coin. Um, uh, BSOs being there to support and then market out the, the value. Um, it's extremely important, but then we need to draw a line when the CISO should not expect that business will now generate sales, right? That's a different ball game. I mean, not that business are not capable to do it. It's just that the scope of work would change uh, significantly, I would say, and the focus that the business would put on, on, on that. But but truly, um, for me, the, the business role, it is indeed a value-driven uh, role, uh, and then it brings value if placed it properly according to the needs of the business and the needs uh, from a from a security perspective for the company. Yeah, it's not it's not selling in the biblical sense, and we should be, we should be clear about that. We're not we're not we're not putting sales targets on BSOs and commissioning them to uh, you know sell sales to their subordinate businesses, but it's it's about just getting that that buy in and and, and yeah. yeah, getting that value. It's more you. about promoting than really selling. Yeah. In yeah, that's so the, yeah. Diploma, <laughs> diplomacy and translation, isn't it? I think it sounds like. But just a quick question for you both is sort of why did you become BSOs? Did you, is it a way to expand your skills or to do different things? I'm just curious about yeah, what, what prompted you to take on the role, Sneha? I, I, I would say that uh, you know, prior to this, I was working with an IT consulting company. Uh, I was working with Capgemini and uh, oh, there, there was a, not a similar setup, but if you, you can still say, you know, the moment when you say regional BSOs, so we, we have a group CISO and then we have... Uh, um, for every region has a CSO, cybersecurity officer. And then right. that's more or less, yeah, it's not a BISO BISO role because then, you know, IT consulting companies don't have business business. It is all IT all over. But mm. 
and then from that role to this role i think it was just a natural move uh, when i was looking to to get more into corporate industrial sector and not uh, want to do consulting anymore i thought this was a very very natural move and uh, i was as i said it's a dual role and i'm glad that it's a dual yeah. role that i don't have to look at suppliers and vendors all the time but i'm say at the same time i'm not stuck with business and i get the security and the other perspective in so yeah for me it it, it was it was by chance but then it was also a very natural for me to take on this role i guess yeah adriano it's similar for you just sort of expand your skill set a bit do different kinds of things yeah for me it was a bit like um back and forth uh when i started uh, into security i had the opportunity to do a lot of the bezo row uh functions uh, or a part of that uh, then i moved into more grc sort of uh the um, i would say job roles and then I was feeling, okay, I need something more into the concrete aspect of the job uh, of my day. And then that's what I like uh, of understanding a business context and see how can we apply uh, those security controls. There are um, kind of one recipe for all, but we can just push that down to a business. So let's see how can we best apply those. And the other aspect for the business for me that is quite interesting is get exposure uh, to to customers uh, and requirements and then and, and things that are happening in the market. I think that is a quite good way to um, develop skills uh, and then and learn them from them. Right. Yeah, I don't know if you got that impression, Paul. That just sort of it's quite a, a rounded role by the sound of it. Because I guess does it, but does it mean that CISOs stay in their ivory tower is the wrong word, but sort of technical domain kind of thing? Really, I just wonder what you know, how it changes an organisation to have a few BSOs there as well. Well, the, the, you know, the nature of security leadership is certainly changing, um, but but equally there are different types of CISOs wearing, you know, different types of hats. You've got technical CISOs, post-breach CISOs, transformational CISOs. The role is incredibly adaptive. I think the reality that we all have to recognise is, you know, our principal job is to manage business risk. But all of those dynamics change over time, which means that we have to be highly adaptive. I think... Um, I think the BSO role is probably the, the, the kind of closest quasi leadership role in security that has a bit of a consultative hat to it, which which you know maybe stay why why you're you're naturally drawn to it because I think it you know it draws on a lot of your Cap Gemini experience and kind of pulls it all together and culminates in a role that was almost written for you you know so um so I, I just think you, you know we have to recognise that the, these roles are, are highly adaptive and and I think the BSO role probably the most adaptive of all. We have seen examples, um, albeit small examples, of organisations that, that, that believe that the responsibility and accountability should equally be dispersed to the point where they actually say, do we actually need a CISO? You know, the BSOs can do the heavy lifting and be that senior leader. And, and actually, the ultimate accountability sits with the business and the data owners and culminates with the board. You know, do we need that focal point? in the way that we traditionally Ooh. do. There's no right answer to this, but I think the standout yeah, it's, point is that it's, you know, it's, it's changing, the model is changing. It's like saying if you have sock, then do you need a CISO or does your sock do everything that... Uh, so I, I, as I said, you know, BSOs uh, tend to be the hands and arms of the CISOs into yeah. the organisation and bring that kind of intelligence uh, and knowledge and information that it, that is almost impossible for a CISO to know or retain or process on. And, um, you know, Adriano, you said that there's one recipe for all, but it's, it's just like when, when you have two kids at, at home and one wants waffle and one a pancake, it is almost the same, right? You just right. have a different mold, you just change the batter a little bit and then serve it to them. Man, so, that's a great, what a great way to think of it. That's a very <laughs> good analogy because that's a, what we go through the business, right? I mean, yeah. sometimes it's the same thing, but with a different flavor or shape and form, so... Yeah, but the CISO yeah. will have the casting vote and say, I don't care, you're both having post. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or, the ing- or the ingredients, right? The ingredients the CISO will decide. Those yeah, exactly. are the ingredients yeah, yeah. And, and that's how we Absolutely. go about yeah, it. Yeah. So. There's the ingredients, what are you going to make of it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm just making a list of all the things a BSO is. They're a diplomat, a translator. You do some sales. Promotion, you talk to the other hand, long arms and hands of the CISO. You make 
or you know, you're the chef, <laughs> I guess, you're serving up different things to different people. It sounds great. You know, it's sort of, so yeah, maybe if uh, people listening to this want to be a big so give it a go. It sounds like it's a lot of fun. Sounds great. Uh, thanks, Adriano. Thanks, Sunil. Thanks, Paul. And uh, thanks for listening. Uh, tell your friends, tell your colleagues, tell your dog. Maybe he, they want to listen as well. You can now find ISL podcasts on all major podcast platforms. Look for our page on Audio Boom or Spotify or wherever you get your uh, podcasts. Where just search for Dear Infosec and it'll be on there. And the podcasts are also available at securityforum.org, where you can also learn more about ISF research tools and guidance. <laughs>